Good evening. I'd like to uh, Good evening, everyone. It's, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to our seventh uh, CROC lecture. I'm Jonathan Croston. I'm the Managing Director of the Centre for Eye Research in Australia, and it's great to see so many friends, supporters um, uh, here, to, here tonight. Um, I'd start off by, by showing my respect and to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the elders past and present, uh, on which this, place, this meeting takes place. Um, to Professor Costa, uh, Dr. Andrew Cuthbertson, uh, Mrs. Jackie Croc and the Croc family, um, to colleagues and friends, uh, welcome to the 2016 Croc Lecture. This is our major annual uh, event uh, and really is, is a way of, of, of recognizing our friends and supporters with some, some ex excellent lectures and this year will be, be, be no exception. Um, tonight's lecture is on the art of seeing and the seeing of art and will be delivered by Emeritus Professor Doug Costa. So thank you very much for joining us uh, this evening. I have to start with housekeeping items. Uh, the bathroom's located in the back of the foyer. This is where I do my stewardess um, or steward impersonations, um, where we had our drinks and canapes. In case of an emergency, exits are located on both the left and right-hand side of the stage. The lecture tonight will be recorded, and recording will be available uh, on the CIRA website in the next few days after we've done a little bit of editing. Finally, you will all notice that on your, uh, the, the arms of your chairs, there's some pink leaflets, and these are for the Google Impact Challenge. Now, this is um, a competition that is currently being held uh, by Google, and, and uh, one of our, our researchers, um, William Yan, has been selected in the top 10, um, and this is now going down to a public vote, and so we very much ask for your support of our project. There's a million dollars of research funding um, if we are able to win this award, and it's done on the number of votes. So we ask you all to, to, to vote um, for uh, the project and to distribute this amongst your, your colleagues and, and, and friends, and we're trying to get as much support uh, for Dr. Yan's project uh, as we can. So with that, I'd like to uh, uh, thank um, Dr. Andrew Cuthbertson, um, who is going to introduce our speaker tonight. I'm hoping Andrew will tell us a little bit of a personal connection that he has with our, with our speaker tonight. Uh, Andrew, as many of you will know, is the R&D Director and Chief Scientific Officer uh, at CL CSL, and he'll commence the proceedings tonight by introducing Professor Doug Costa. So Andrew, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, and uh, it's wonderful to be here, and it's a great uh, pleasure to have a go at this uh, challenge of introducing Doug, and I'd start by saying that those of you who follow medical research know that a really hot topic at the moment is around the importance of physician scientists uh, to the translation of basic science discoveries medical research discoveries into clinical practice. And this is something that's debated in Canberra and around the country because physician scientists, clinical scientists, really are an endangered species. We've managed to make it really a really hard career path. And Doug Costa, our speaker tonight, uh, is one of the great Australian uh, clinical scientists. Way before his time um, and against the tide, um, Doug inspired a generation or two of, um, of particularly ophthalmologists to make, a re make research part of their ophthalmology careers. Um, so Doug initially trained in Melbourne. Uh, he t tore a path through and terrorised Moorfields Hospital, a very famous hospital in, in London, and then um, I think made the very interesting and inspired choice to go to... Flinders University, Flinders Medical Centre, um, early on as the Lyons Professor of Ophthalmology, and he stayed there and created one of the great ophthalmology departments in, in the world. And I, I say it was an inspired choice because I think those of you who, who, who know Doug um, know that uh, he needed a degree of freedom, I think, to operate. Um, and those of you who were lucky enough to visit the department and Flinders over the, those decades know what a fabulous atmosphere there was, I mean, at the university, in the medical centre, in that department. Um, and it really was the bench to the clinic and back again 
way before its time, way before it became sort of popular and a mantra uh, in the country and around the world. And I think Doug would agree that it was also the relationship with Karen Williams and their partnership um, uh, together over a long time. They really were a team with K Karen bringing the strong basic science uh, to, to that team. And they have, and Doug may talk about some of these things, uh, but they have a, a fabulous track record of discoveries uh, and publications based on a foundation of immunology, cell biology, but, but growing into clinical translation, uh, which, is, which is truly unusual around the world. So, so as I say, bench to the bedside and back uh, 30 years ahead of its time. And, and there are sort of there are really wonderful large-scale public health enduring clinical research achievements like the establishment of the Australian Cornell Graph Registry, which which is u unique in the, in the world. And in '91, again a long time ago, Doug was recognised uh, with uh, the Order of Australia with for his services to medicine, which is very well deserved. So, quick personal note. Which, which I, I want to do. Um, Doug did all of this with a unique personal style. Unique, in my view, is misused often, uh, but in this case, it's, it's appropriate. He has a unique style. I, I would say Doug is a very serious person underneath, but he is an iconoclast and and with a wonderful, inclusive, generous and enthusiastic approach to personal relationships and, and his profession. Um, and I think perhaps realising as, as he was growing up that he didn't like being told what to do, which I think is true, um, so he has a strong sense of his own independence. I, I think his mentoring style is very good. He's very good at giving young people guidance without appearing to tell them what to do, uh, which I think is, is very powerful. And I, I can personally attest to this, so in, I, I think I've got the year right, 1993, when I first met Doug, we were body surfing at Lawn, successfully caught a wave, one of the few in my life, uh, um, and as we stood up, he said, why don't you do a PhD? <laughs> It, and it was posed as a question, you know, why don't you? You know, what are you doing here? Um, and clearly I was easily led because it completely changed my life from my clinical training, which I, aban which I abandoned, um, intending to go back, but I, and I, maybe I will. Uh, it's getting a bit late. Um, so I changed to a medical research uh, career. So this was advice uh, from which I've never recovered. Um, and Doug has also uh, pushed hard against the ageing process. Um, uh, you know, I, I really remember uh, fondly, uh, well not fondly seeing him hurt himself, but, but Doug and uh, Mark Lone trying to out-sprint each other. Doug unfortunately tore a hamstring. This was after dinner, I think, going up Hindley Street in Adelaide. Um, but he was, I think, in the lead until the hamstring uh, let him down, uh, unfortunately. And I, I can't do this without just a mention of Doug's dad, Jack. Uh, Jack, I, I was very fortunate to be adopted by Jack in Williamstown when I lived in Williamstown. Uh, and he was a fabulous uh, friend to me and my wife, Christabel. And our firstborn son is named Jack after, after Doug, Doug's father. I won't say any more. He, that would require a, a two-hour lecture to talk about uh, Jack Costa. But, um, but I, I would say Doug's real legacy, which is huge, um, is in the young people that he's trained and inspired to be physician scientists, particularly in ophthalmology, but it goes way beyond uh, ophthalmology. Uh, they're a large and formidable group. Uh, I'll mention Neil Della and uh, Peter Van Weingarten. There are a lot of others. Um, but, but they're good examples, I think. And I'm very, very proud uh, to be able to count myself as one of them. So with that, I'd like to call on Professor Doug Custard to deliver 
the 2016 Croc Lecture, which he's entitled The Art of Seeing and the Seeing of Art. Doug. <laughs> Well, um, thank you very much, Andrew, for a, an over generous for an over generous uh, introduction, and thank you, Jonathan, for the invitation to be here today to celebrate the professional achievements of uh, Jared Croc. For those of you who didn't know Jared, he was the first uh, professor of ophthalmology in Australia, and is the most accomplished and influential ophthalmologist Australia has produced. Um, his contribution was based on an extraordinarily high intelligence, uh, great aptitude for clinical medicine, and sheer hard work. He was a, a very uh, committed man. My generation learned a lot from him, and not just about ophthalmology. Uh, we had many uh, discussions, many wide-ranging discussions that I can remember, and they were about things, other things that he was interested in, like history and art. And uh, I selected to talk tonight about art rather than some drier uh, ophthalmological subject that I've probably left behind anyway. Uh, the gist of uh, what I'm about to say is that artists know a lot about art. Uh, art artists know a lot about vision and they've known a lot about vision for a very long time. They were the first people to pursue an understanding of the visual process for professional reasons. Uh, they came a long time before ophthalmologists and vision scientists. Uh, visual artists are particularly interested in illusions. Not surprising because uh, they are, amongst other things, illusionists. And as visual artists, they've got a lot to work with because the visual system is very prone to illusions. It's prone to illusions for a number of reasons, but two important reasons are that the visual system is very fast, it's more or less instantaneous. And uh, in order to achieve the speeds that are required, assumptions are made. The other thing about the visual system, and I mean the eye, particularly the retina, and the visual brain, which is, well, there's three quarters of the brain involved in vision in some way. Um, the function of, of the visual system is not only to detect things, visual stimulus from the environment, but to make sense of it. And there's a great deal of ambiguity. And the ambiguity is resolved by, again, making assumptions. Assumptions are never invariably correct and when they fail you get an illusion rather than the uh, reality. Now um, I'm going to concentrate today uh, on the illusions that are important to artists. By artists I'm, I'm really talking about painters and drawing. So these illusions are illusions related to edges, to uh, the illusion of space and form, the way they create three-dimensional uh, three pictorial space and a two-dimensional surface with particular reference to perspective and, the, and shape from shading. And I'll say a little bit about colour. I'll start with edges. This is a brush painting uh, by a Chinese artist, Ma Yun. He was active about 1100. And uh, let me see if I can work this. Uh, um, 
and uh, he's paid particular attention to the, to the edges. You see, it, it's a simple picture of some uh, mountains in front of a lighter sky. But notice in these uh, edges here, on the inside of the mount, mountain uh, edge, it's darker. And on the light side, on the sky side, it's a little bit lighter. And this has a profound effect on the amount of greyness you see in any part of the picture. I'll explain this a little further uh, down the line. This had been practiced for a thousand years before Ma Yun, and it's been practiced by artists ever since. This is a part of a drawing from Leonardo, and you can see the same uh, uh, device used here. The uh, lightness on where he wants to be light, he's made a light line inside the edge and darker on the outside, and the same on the uh, front of the hand. And Georges Seurat, the French pointillist, he manipulated edges, but for a different reason. Um, he's trying to create extreme lights and extreme darks by special attention to the edges, to, by putting uh, the dark beside where he wants it to be light. Um, and this has an intensifying effect. I don't know how well this uh, illusion will work. I vary from auditorium to auditorium, but some of you, anyway, will see this as lighter than the edge. But they are the same white. Um, it might be more obvious in, in this example. Most of you will see dark columns on the left and the right and a lighter column in the middle. But if you hold your finger up and block off the edge, each edge, you'll find that it's in fact a confluent grey. This effect is created exactly like Ma Yuan did it by making the, this side a little dark and this side a little light. It's a very uh, strong effect. Now we know about the neuroscience of this. And the neuroscience of this began with this man. He's a Warrnambool High School uh, uh, boy, uh, uh, John Eccles, who, who uh, came up to uh, Newman College and St Vincent's Clinical School, uh, two institutions that were important in Gerard Trock's training. And he invented intracellular recording. He did this by developing uh, probes that were so small that they could be introduced into individual uh, brain cells and eye cells uh, so that their scientists could li listen to their activity. He won the Nobel Prize in 1963. Now, um, this is a diagram of the retina. Um, so up here you have the photoreceptors and then the bipolar and horizontal cells which help these receptors uh, communicate with each other and then the ganglion cell which runs back into the visual brain. And these edge effects are due to centre surround effects sometimes called lateral inhibition. And, and what the inter, intracellular recording showed was that if the central cells are stimulated those beside them, those surrounding them, become suppressed and even harder to stimulate. So the light looks lighter and the dark looks darker. And when that's summated along an edge, you can see why you get the edge effects um, that I've been talking about and what Ma Yuan knew about um, a thousand years ago. Now, other artists manipulated edges in other ways. This is Renoir. He liked his women soft-edged. And uh, he achieved that by, not by lightening and darkening, but by putting a half-tone uh, along the edge. And Cezanne took it at, all of this a step far, farther. Cezanne really thought hard about the visual process. And he realised that he only had to colour the edges that um, we would automatically assume 
the colour of the centre if we recognise what was going on at the edge. So what this is telling us about the visual process is that unlike a TV camera or a TV set or a, uh, an ordinary camera where all the pixels are managed equally, in the visual system we take more notice of some things than others. And what's along the edge turns out to be more important than what's in the confluent areas. We're very good at, at uh, recognising discontinuities and enhancing them. So much so that a line diagram like this, this is uh, a portrait uh, from David uh, Hockney of his mother. We don't have any trouble recognising this and coping with this. And yet there are no, uh, nothing depicted like this in nature. It's all due to our uh, edge enhancing uh, mechanisms. Now let me go on to space. Um, the illusion of space. But first, um, a primer on how we judge the space around us. We use a number of cues. One of the cues is just simply a occlusion. Things that are in the front block the view of things that are behind. And then there's perspective. In its simplest uh, form, the simplest way to think about perspective is that something that's in the distance will be smaller than if it was in the foreground. It also means that parallel uh, lines like the top and the bottom of the wall converge and eventually meet at what I call the vanishing point, which is at eye level and in a flat world that'll be the horizon. So there's perspective but there's also parallax. If you move back and forth, the things in front will move laterally faster than the things at the back. And then there's another thing which is uh, volume, the volume of these objects. Uh, is this uh, thing over here, is that a disk or is it a sphere? Well, we decide that on the amount of light reflected back from it. The, uh, the, loom the pattern of luminance off the surface. And uh, uh, we usually don't have any trouble uh, with that at all. And then we get some extra, so we get the shape from the shading and then we also get some help from cast shadows. Now, let's go on to perspective in a little bit more detail. Perspective can be thought of as the geometric framework of pictorial space. As I've said, parallel lines converge to the, uh, to the vanishing point uh, here, um, and there's a recession in, in size as things go into the background, and that's a highly um, regulated thing, or, or it's, it's entirely uh, predictable. If you get that wrong, the painting doesn't look quite right. Now, there's always been some attempt at perspective, some better than others. In Greek and Roman times, this, this is uh, something off the wall, a fresco off the wall in Pompeii, and you can see that some attempt has been made at uh, perspective here. But for the most part, in those times, the, the perspective was, well, it, it, it was based on empirical studio rules and it was inconsistent. It didn't matter through medieval times because art was more about iconography then than it was about the depiction of reality. All of this changed in 1413. Uh, with this man, Filippo Brunelleschi. He was one of the fathers of the Renaissance. He trained as uh, a goldsmith, and then he became a surveyor, and then he became an architect, and then he became an engineer, and a very good one at that, because in his later life, he was the man who designed the impossible dome on Florence Cathedral. But in 1413, 
he, uh, he discovered perspective. He didn't invent it, he discovered it. It's a natural, it's a law of physiological optics. Um, but a lot of fuss was made about this. Because he was a goldsmith, he had access, they were the opticians of the day, so he was able to, well, he had access to mirrors and lenses and so on, and he drew in the mirrors. And then he was able to define what he was doing mathematically because he was a surveyor. Surveyor's based, surveying is based on triangulation, so too is perspective. So he came up with the mathematics. By doing that, he, can, he turned this from an art into a science. Definition of a science is something, a way of thinking about something that has predictive value. And he certainly gave it that. He was a good uh, proselytizer. Um, had some spectacular demonstrations of what he was doing uh, that got a lot of attention. And uh, one of the first to take up uh, his method was his young friend, Masaccio. And this fresco is, it's, it's the first uh, use of Brunelleschi's technique that's still around. It's a fresco on the wall at Santa Maria Novella in, in, um, in Florence. And it was a sensation at the time because of the way um, the, the side chapel ran back into the wall. Nobody had seen that sort of thing uh, before. Um, it is, of course, a painting of the Holy Trinity. It's a rather um, unusual, uh, unexpected topic for the first serious incursion of science into art. Now, he's, uh, uh, he, had, he got a great uh, deal of help in, in uh, propagating his ideas and disseminating them from... Uh, Leon Battista Alberti, he was a scholar, he was a painter, and uh, a writer. And uh, that picture from Astaccio was, was 1424. In the early 1430s, Alberto wrote uh, a three-volume treatise on painting. And he dedicated it to Brunelleschi, and the first volume was about perspective. He simplified the mathematics, made it easier for people to understand, and he came up with an invention of his own. He realised that if he put a, uh, a frame in the picture plane and then hung a net over it, like a socket net, uh, all you had to do was draw what was in each square. And this became known as Alberti's window. I don't know if I said it, but the book he, he dedicated to Brunelleschi was quite accepting that it was, all of this was uh, Brunelleschi's uh, idea. Now, everybody took up the idea of Alberti's window. Everybody had their own drawing machine. I could show you a series of 20 pictures of drawing machines. I'll show you just one, which is Leonardo. And the thing to note here is that here is his, his screen, he, did, he didn't use a net, he did a semi-transparent um, membrane. Um, and there's this thing here that makes sure that he's looking from exactly the same spot. There's a board with a hole in it and he always uses one eye and looks through the hole at, at the object that he's drawing. Everybody had something like this. And by Baroque times, Drawing in perspective had become an art form in itself. And it produced paintings like this. This is the interior of St. Peter's Cathedral by Panini. And there were other notable exponents of the art, like Canaletto. Now, whether they uh, did it with a drawing machine or a camera obscura or lenses or whatever, it's neither here nor there. It was, it was a highly successful successful way of painting. And it was successful because it appealed, it appealed to a fundamental uh, expectation of the visual system. The visual system expects to see things in perspective. It's, it's hardwired. It's, uh, 
It's inherited, something that's evolved over, over millions of years. And uh, you can see that with the uh, illusions. This is the Posno illusion uh, after an Italian uh, uh, experimental psychologist from about 1910. Now all of you will see the upper horizontal line as larger than the lower one. And if you don't believe that, look at these figures. They are the same size. And it's impossible, this is so deeply ingrained that it's impossible to reject it, to overwrite it. Even when you know they're the same size, you can't see them for what they are. And what this means is that we interpret the size of something from the background that it's in. And these uh, square tiles are very potent in this regard. And it also explains why in so many classical paintings there's a black and white tiled floor. It increases the, uh, the, the perception of depth. Now, in due course, people became dissatisfied with this classical perspective because, as, as I demonstrated, it, it's an unusual way of seeing through one tiny little hole from one fixed place. It's not the way we normally see. One of the first to express his disquiet in his work was Turner. And Turner knew a lot about perspective. He was the professor of perspective at the Royal Academy from uh, 1806 to 1836. Um, and what you've got here, this is a painting of um, Petworth Park in Sussex. And the, the road in the front is curved, but it's actually a straight road. And what he was recognising was that perspective only works for the central 30 degrees of field. After that, you have to move your eyes. And when you move your eyes, the vanishing points change. And, uh, and, and then, you know, everything's, the geometry is all set up again. Someone else who, who thought even more about this was Cezanne. Now, if you look at this painting, you'd think this was done by a rank amateur if you didn't recognise it as Cezanne. The, the, uh, the table, not even the table, is a consistent plane. The things that are sitting on it are not in the same plane, uh, don't relate to each other in that regard. And it's as if there are multiple vanishing points in this painting. And indeed there are. And what Suzanne is saying here is that we don't look from one spot. We build up our view of the world by moving our eyes, by moving our heads, by walking around. And somehow our visual brain puts all this together into a coherent view. Science has shown in recent years that it's very small bites, about three degrees that are put together by our uh, ultra-short uh, memories. Now, Cezanne was influential and others took up, uh, were interested in the way he was seeing this. And uh, Braque and Picasso uh, took it up and exaggerated it and that was Cubism. This is the Cubist portrait of Dora Maar by Picasso. Now I want to say sh something about shape from volume, shape and volume surface shape and therefore volume from shading and the technical term for shading is luminance. Now just concentrating to begin with with this panel here. Most of you will see these to be little buttons like uh, Smarties or M&Ms or whatever they call them these days illuminated from the right. You go down to the bottom panel uh, you still assume that that's illuminated from the right, and therefore this is concave. 
most people think things are illuminated from the right, but if you really uh, concentrate, you'll be able to reverse that and then these will become concave. Now, in most situations, we can tell where the light's coming from. Like in this right-hand panel, uh, sort of a squidge of toothpaste, it's the main thing in the picture, and so we get our clue about the light from it. It's coming from the right, and therefore this is a convex button and this is a concave button. Um, what's been just, uh, written a lot about a lot lately is just how we pick up how this system works. It seems as if we have in our visual brain a library of shapes, common shapes. There's about 20 of them, actually. Sphere, cone, conoid, pyramid, you know, saddle, uh, cubed, etc. And we have a mechanism for comparing what we're looking at uh, to the classical shapes. Now, science is only coming to this now, but artists have known about these sorts of things for a very a long time. Oh, before I get there, most of you will assume that this, these buttons are illuminated from the top and therefore convex. But if you stand on your head, <laughs> then they would be, the light would be coming from below, from the floor, and they would be concave. And um, uh, that's not surprising, you know. It, it, when our, if we go back long enough and to when our ancestors were amoebae in the swamps, the light always came from above. It has, you know, right through evolution. And as I was saying, artists have known about this for a very long time, and it, you can tell that from the way paintings were done in Renaissance times. The, uh, this is an unfinished uh, painting by Perino del Vago. So he was late Renaissance, uh, same orbit as Raphael and Michelangelo. It's an unfinished portrait. And what they did first was to paint um, in a monochrome to begin with until the shape was right, until the volumes were right. And then they glazed over the surface with the colours, thin colours, maybe 25, 30 glazes. But they knew that they had to get the reading of the shape correct in the first place. Now, just a little bit about colour. Vast subject, so we can only do a little bit. But look at just some aspects. Now, modern ideas on colour began with Newton and, so, and some experiments he did in his rooms in Cambridge in uh, 1668. Famously, he split the white light coming through his window with a prism to project the visible spectrum on the wall. Um, he, he was, uh, you know, Newton did have an idea or two and um, one of the things that he pointed out very early was that the world isn't really coloured. Uh, colour is entirely a creation of the mind. The world is bathed in electromagnetic radiation from very long uh, radio waves at one end to very short high energy cosmic rays at the other and there's a tiny slither at one point that we call the visible spectrum. And that light has the wavelength that will excite the photoreceptors, the cones, the um, colour uh, sensing uh, photoreceptors. And there are three sorts of colour receptors. The, red, the one on the top, for a, which is maximally sensible, sensitive to long wavelengths, short wavelengths and to intermediate wavelengths. And until uh, the light engages these photoreceptors, there is no colour. We make it up. Um, if 
you only have two photoreceptors, then you're colourblind, like 10% of males. And it's interesting perhaps to think what would happen if there was a mutation and somebody had four photoreceptors? Then uh, they would see better than us and we would be colourblind. And um, that, in a way that's a reality because uh, the television set makers are making sets, are beginning to make sets that have four phosphors, not just the red, blue and green, but they've got a yellow in it. And the, the quality of the image is absolutely superb. They're just waiting for all of you to buy uh, the high definition sets before they release this next lot on, <laughs> onto the market. Now how do we see, we can pick up a thousand uh, slightly different hues, more. How do we do that with only three receptors? Well, um, we do it because of the way the receptors are wired. The short, medium and long sensitivity receptors. And this is a very simplified um, wiring diagram. And it's only really been the last 20 or 30 years that this has been sorted out. But the reason I included it tonight was that the deduction of, from all this is that there's a yellow, blue, a red, green, and a white, black channel, uh, which is exactly what Leonardo said 500 years ago. Now, uh, Newton also made another direct contribution to painting. Um, when he looked at the spectrum on the wall of his room in Cambridge, he saw a little bit of blue in the red end and a little bit of red in the blue end, so he thought they must be part of a circle, so he joined up the ends. And then he ended up with a circle with the blue opposite the yellow and the red opposite the green. And this was really the first uh, colour wheel. Um, and it was taken up pretty enthusiastically by painters and it's impossible to go to a painting school these days without getting uh, a fair bit of the colour wheel. And painters, experienced painters, always have one uh, close by. One of the strong advocates to begin with was, was again Turner. And he noticed another thing about colour. It's not just the hue, the blue, the red, the greenness. There's the issue that some colours are lighter than other colours. Some are some colours are quite dark. And he uh, described that ye yellow was the colour of light and red and blue was the colour of shadows. And you can see that in this uh, set of blocks. And it, oh my goodness, uh, how did that happen? What have I done? Huh? I've gone back a lot, long way though. Um, this is the luminance, the amount of light coming off these uh, different colours. Yellow is the lightest, then green, then blue, and then red. Now a painter has to take both of those things into consideration. The, the luminance and the hue. Because I've already said that the shape is determined, determined by the luminance. Uh, and so you can't just look at the colour because it might give you the wrong shape. And one person who played with that was Matisse. And when he released this, uh, exhibited this painting in 19, 1907, there was a tremendously uh, vocal reaction, most of it negative. People didn't like the lurid colours on the woman's face. This is called uh, the woman with the hat. And what they did, they didn't like the yellow highlight in the face or the blue or the purple or the green shadows on the face. But you could still read the face okay. And one way of checking luminance is just to take a black and white picture of the original and you can see that he had the luminance exactly right. 
Now, uh, I just wanted to say something else about this discoordination of, of hue and luminance. This is a, f it, it, and the perceptual consequences of having the luminance the same. Uh, this is a famous painting, um, Impression of Sunrise by uh, Monet. It is the painting that gave the Impressionist movement its name. And uh, even in the reproduction, but particularly in the original, that sun really shimmers. And so does, too does its reflection off the water. Now we can, we can tell what it is that's shimmering. It's the sun and its reflection. Because deciding what something is, is done with colour and shape. The visual system can't tell where something is unless there's a difference in luminance, contrast between the object and its background. So when you look at a black and white picture of this, you can't see the sun or, the, or its reflection. So what's happening here is that the visual system can't find it, so it's hunting for it, and it makes the sun shimmer. There are a lot of French paintings uh, of uh, red poppies in green fields. And, and they seem to waver in the wind. And it's the same thing. Easy to see the difference between the red and the green, but hard to tell where the poppies are. And so they, they wave around a bit. Now, I want to conclude with this picture. It's uh, a portrait of uh, Pope Innocent X. Uh, it, it was done by the Spanish court painter Diego Velasquez in 1650, reputedly in one three-hour sitting. And the first reason for including it is that it is uh, just a wonderfully powerful image. There are many experts who feel this is as good as painting ever got. And there are individuals like Francis Bacon, the, the uh, 20th century English painter who admitted to being completely obsessed by this picture and uh, over the 10 or 15 years painted 45 paintings based on its inspiration. Its power is in its aesthetics. Um, always hard to define what the, the, the specifics of aesthetics but some things that add up here are the composition, the power of the muted uh, palette, um, the virtuosity of the brush strokes in the original, uh, the very light, uh, uh, funny brush strokes that are in contrast with the, 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 the uh, formality of the rest of the painting, uh, the way he's captured the sitter. Um, this is the most powerful man in Velasquez's world. Um, and yet he's been able to catch uh, the, the pomposity or arrogance at the same time as he's captured the, uh, the vulnerability of the man. He's captured the irritability, and yet he's still managed to make him look handsome. He was 76, the Pope, when this was done. Velasquez was smart enough to make him look handsome, more handsome and younger. So the power is actually in, in, the, co in the aesthetics. Velasquez was uh, uh, a highly educated uh, painter who was into every technical trick. He had a vast library on, on uh, optics and perspective. He had uh, and used lenses and mirrors and artificial light and drawing machines. He, got, he was up with every technicality, but none of that gives this the power. The power comes from the image he created in his mind and was able to put on the canvas. Now, we know a lot about the art of seeing and the seeing of art, much more than I've uh, brought up today. Um, and we're learning more and more all the time, especially at the level of the neuroscience. However, when it comes to creativity and uh, aesthetics and beauty, 
we, we have no knowledge of the uh, neurobiology at all. And maybe that's a good thing. The, the second reason I wanted to conclude with this image was that it reminds me of a conversation I had with Jared Kropp, um, well, more than 40 years ago. Um, it, it was a one-sided conversation about popes. And um, with my background, I didn't know anything about popes. I thought a pope was a brand of washing machine. And I can remember how much fun Jared seemed to get from introducing me to the papacy. And um, I, as I've already mentioned, uh, Jared had uh, wonderful professional standing. He had a lot of technical knowledge and uh, wherewithal. And he had a fantastic general knowledge. But what I admired most at a personal level was something that came out in the conversation that we had about the popes and the way he had conducted that conversation. He was always fun to be with. Thank you for listening. Doug, I'd, I'd really like to thank you for really an outstanding, a very clear lecture showing how, you know, the, the artists have exploited the eye, a beautiful structure and the hard wiring of the brain to allow us to appreciate beautiful images. So really that was a phenomenal and a really lovely lecture and we thank you for that. I'd like to ask Jackie Crock now to come up and please present um, our speaker with, a, with a, a memento of the, of the lecture. So Doug, if you'd like to come, come forward, please. To, uh, to, to conclude the proceedings, I'd like to thank um, Maggie and, and Val for all their hard work in putting tonight on, to the caterers and to Melbourne University for allowing us to, to use this room, but most importantly for, to the speakers, um, but also to the audience for, for being here. You've all been very loyal supporters of Syria, and we hope that will continue uh, with time, times to come, and uh, we hope you've en enjoyed the evening tonight. So I'd like to uh, finalise and, and finish with that. And again, thank you to Doug Costa for a, for a great lecture. <laughs> Thank you.